Hello there. Thank you for agreeing to come out here to this beautiful golf course and uh, take part in my lecture. It's a beautiful day for it. We just got done playing a quick 18 and I'll tell you what, I am whooped. So again, thank you for joining. Um, this is a supply chain investigation into the Odyssey triple track putter, which happens to be the putter in my own bag. So to start us off, we're just gonna get right into it. We're gonna watch a quick video about the triple track putter and we're gonna start diving into the investigation. The triple track putter is just one of the many putters that Odyssey sells to a global consumer market. Odyssey is a sub company of the larger Callaway Golf Company. To further investigate Odyssey and the Odyssey putter, we're going to be looking into the larger Callaway supply chain network. Callaway Golf is headquartered in Carlsbad, California, and it distributes products throughout its many subsidiaries, including Odyssey, Callaway Apparel, Top Golf. Jack Wolfskin, and many more companies. Callaway Golf generates an average of 1.2 billion US dollars annually. Callaway Golf trades under the ticker ELY on most major markets, including the New York Stock Exchange. The fact that this is a public IPO means that they are likely to be more transparent with their finances and supply chain sources because they appeal to a public investor's market. That's something that I really consider to be transparent and uh, a good kind of observation to make at this point in our investigation. The raw materials that it takes to build a putter can be broken down by the anatomy of the club. There are three main parts to the putter, the head, the shaft, and the grip. And the major minerals that I was able to isolate in the construction of the putter is steel, rubber, graphite, tantalum, tin, tungsten, and gold. These raw materials, as we're gonna learn and see throughout this presentation, really makes uh, golf clubs and specifically the Odyssey putter a real, a true global product. So as I said, the raw materials I was able to, to identify throughout my research process are steel, rubber, graphite, tin, tantalum, tin, tungsten, and gold. Um, today we're gonna to be talking a lot about conflict minerals um, and we're gonna be looking at how that, that part of their supply chain and how they interact with it as a company. So tin, tantalum, tungsten, and gold are classified as conflict minerals and stem from the DRC countries. Largely, the DRC countries are understood as the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Sudan, Uganda, Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda, Zambia, Angola, the Republic of the Congo, and Central Africa. So when we say DRC countries, we're really talking about the Democratic Republic of the Congo and all the countries that are, um, that are uh, just bordering it around it that deal with kind of like the extracting of these, uh, these minerals. These conflict minerals and the revenue that they generate from exports have been known to directly or indirectly finance armed groups in the, D in the DRC countries. The conditions in which these minerals are produced are just absolutely terrible. Child labor, violation of human rights, sexual and physical exploitation are all characteristics of the conflict mineral trade.
pop culture and recent events have given everyone around the world a basic understanding of what blood diamonds are. But how about conflict minerals? Simply put, these are minerals that are used every day in a wide variety of products. The operations, mining, processing, and shipping of these minerals funnel money into oppressive regimes all over the world that are engaged in military conflict, slavery, genocide, and other human rights abuses. The main minerals that can most often be traced to these regimes are called the three T's, tin, tantalum, and tungsten. Together with gold, these minerals are mined largely in the Democratic Republic of the Congo or an adjoining country where military conflicts and civil war has claimed the lives of millions. In 2010, President Obama signed the Dodd-Frank Consumer Protection Act into law, which includes an article spelling out that American companies must report where the minerals used in their products come from. This has dramatically reduced the revenue being funneled into armed militias in conflict areas. So as we learned from the video just there, it talks about the labor conditions surrounding conflict minerals. Included in these conditions is human rights abuses, child labor, slave labor, physical and sexual exploitation. But these conflict minerals don't just create uh, terrible labor conditions, they also have major environmental effects. Mining conflict minerals and the negative effects on the environment from which they are extracted, the creation of informal mining facilities in regions with little to no oversight of regulatory, regulatory bodies causes deforestation, damaging land use practices like destructive irrigation, and can poison the soil, water, and air with contaminants and air pollution. All of these environmental impacts can lead to health problems in the laborers and to the populations that facilitate the mining activities. Deforestation and damaging land management practices can eliminate the possibility of agriculture and damage uh, food availability and economic growth. These factors impact local populations and ecosystems potentially for hundreds of years. So as you can see, these conflict minerals, they have um, you know, terrible labor conditions and a lot of uh, uh, human concerns, but there's also another level of environmental effects that this sort of uh, material mining um, produces as well. Pop culture and So in the video, she talks a little bit about um, some of the conflict mineral in, in labor policies that are out there. So we're just going to quickly review those. The Dodd-Frank Act and Wall Street Consumer Reform and Protection Act, which is the act that she mentioned in her video, was very crucial and really um, combating the conflict mineral uh, market and and trying to get those funds out of those armed groups hands. Uh, what the Dodd-Frank Act did was disclose, which made it a requirement for companies to disclose the use of conflict minerals in their products. And if they are going to be using conflict minerals, they have to be essential to the production of the product. If they can be substituted or if there's an easy, um, if there's an easy mineral that can replace it, then that must be pursued as well. The uh, major act or the bill that, um, that really made the most difference for conflict minerals and labor conditions is the Public-Private Alliance for Responsible Mineral Trade. Uh, that's the PPA. This was in 2011. This was a really, uh, really big step towards making sure that these conflict minerals and their repercussions are um, more controllable and a lot more avoidable. Biggest thing to really take away from this is that um, the PPA breaks the link between conflict, mineral revenue, and violence and human rights abuses. Uh, it really just encompasses the developing of supply chain systems to provide these conflict minerals, but they're vetted. These supply chains, you know, they've been worked out top to bottom and they've been established to where they are legit and they're a lot easier to regulate. And so instead of having private companies do this themselves, uh, the PPA went out and they made these supply chains available to private companies so that they could use their vetted supply chains and not run the risk of um, you know, do, giving revenue and money to these conflict minerals and potentially armed groups. So the PPA was just wildly successful in reducing the amount of revenue to conflict mineral groups, um, created a lot more transparency, and above all, it provided a plug and play supply chain system for private companies that was already been vetted and therefore gets approved and is a lot less regulated. Um, 
So really just all in all made a really big difference to that process. So when I was looking at Callaway Golf, um, I was able to kind of find a, or put together a really kind of brief timeline here. This goes from raw minerals to local golf shops. Um, so the raw, raw minerals, they're, you know, mined by uh, variable companies. Of course, some of them are probably legit and non-legit or formal and informal. Um, with these DRC countries, it's really hard to regulate. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, and then audited every two years. So we'll talk about that as well. This is a part of Callaway's policy. But as you can see, you know, the, between the DRC countries and the manufacturing and assembly countries, which include Mexico, China, Japan, England, um, and the distribution centers, which they pop up as the market uh, grows for golf equipment. So really the um, potential for this company to be global is huge and it already is a huge company but it just it, its ability to be able to pop up locations or or whatnot really make it um impactful and really show like how diverse and how uh global this company really is all the way from raw minerals all the way to the, your local golf shops um, so what are the labor conditions along the the Callaway Golf supply chain. So Callaway, Callaway Golf has made considerable efforts to create positive outcomes for labor conditions within their company and its supply chain. The amount of transparency from the company is something that I found I personally found very surprising. There was a lot of information that they provided, but there's also just a lot of information about these um, vetted supply chains with the PPA that I was able to find as well. Um, so I found that kind of surprising how uh, you know available some of the information is. I thought it was going to be a lot more secretive, but this is a big deal, and the companies are definitely making efforts to to address their supply chains. Um, so yeah, I found that surprising. Here are a couple screen grabs of some various policies that Callaway Golf um, they have on their website. They they, they show this to investors. Um, this is also kind of a part of their 2018 annual summary. So Callaway Golf established a social compliance summary. So this is the supplier uh, or the social compliance up here on the top left. That's a, a audit that they do every two years on all of their facilities, uh, manufacturers, their mineral sources from top to bottom. Every two years they do an audit and they reevaluate all of these um, all of these uh, factories and all of these suppliers just to make sure that they are actually in compliance with their um, supplier code of conduct and their transparency in the supply chain. So they are you know, very active at making sure that they're consistently reevaluating their supply chains. One of the key protocols uh, that the company has adopted is the supplier code of conduct, which outlines um, that every Callaway golf supplier must follow certain uh, rules and I'm gonna go ahead and list these rules really quick. Every Callaway golf supplier must comply with anti-bribery and all other laws, use voluntary employment, deal lawfully with foreign contracts and in, in migrant workers, ensure that employees are 16 years or older, provide a workplace free of harassment, discrimination, and abuse, ensure fair and accurate compensation, ensure that working hours are not excessive, use fair and accurate compensation, ensure that working hours are not excessive, use fair and non-discriminatory employment terms and practices, provide a healthy and safe workplace, allow freedom of association and collective bargaining. I personally thought that one was pretty interesting because they allow the freedom of association and collective bargaining. It pretty much allows them that their employees can then unionize and collective bargain together. I thought that was pretty unique, especially with how global this uh, supply chain is. Um, I thought it was interesting that Callaway chose to adopt that for all of their suppliers. Um, ensure conflict-free sourcing, comply with customs, act with honesty and transparency. Callaway Golf makes sure to enforce and evaluate these objectives by facilitating audits of its suppliers and faculty and facilities on a two-year basis. Although this is a big step for such a massive international organization, suppliers are given a two week heads up before any sort of inspection or audit. And an audit hasn't taken place since 2018. So that's a consideration. I'm sure it's, it's COVID related, but um, you know, they are outside of that two year threshold and they are given a two week heads up before any sort of inspection. 
These two gaps in their policy have no doubt led to abuses in these areas. Given the massive scope of this company and the various conditions, physical, political, and social contexts that the company operates in, it's impossible to say that the labor conditions across the company are fair. Given the context we understand in our contemporary and throughout this class, uh, you know, we can assume that the conditions along a supply chain of this size, they've got to be subpar. We're going to talk really quick about how the product is uh, disposed of when it's done and any sort of waste factors. So there is a massive market for used golf equipment. I mean, you can see golf equipment that has a return or, you know, a, a, a market value or a market rate that can go all the way into 10 years. Some of the nicer stuff can even be, you know, 20, 30 years. I had a putter once that was like 30 years old. So there is a big market for used equipment. Uh, Callaway has adopted a pretty awesome exchange program where they you can actually send them your Callaway clubs. They'll recycle the old clubs and give you discounts on new ones. I thought that this was really cool um, because you know it's actually like asking for their their minerals and their material back, and then that's going into new clubs, um, or it's going onto their used market. They have their own market that they sell used clubs off of. Um, so Callaway, you know, they have a really good way of kind of just disposing of their uh, clubs or, you know, retaining the value in used clubs, especially. A lot of these materials are recyclable. So that's another factor that, you know, Callaway is pretty smart in asking for return on their clubs because it might actually save them a lot of money by recycling, especially with the supply chain issues we've seen uh, because of COVID. And then most of the actual like material waste comes from transport and shipping. So all the plastics that they come in and stuff like that. Um, but again, that recycle program is, is really awesome that they run. So I just have some pretty general conclusions about this investigation. This investigation explores uh, only one of Callaway's thousands of products and services that they have throughout the company. With such an expansive global supply chain, it would be near impossible to audit and evaluate each supplier for compliance with the Callaway's code of conduct. The use of conflict minerals in clubs raises a huge red flag for labor conditions and human rights concerns, regardless of the supply chain that they choose to follow, whether it's PPA or if they decide to vet their own. As we learned in this class, these networks for conflict minerals are extremely secretive and hard to track. They're, some of them are illegitimate and then funnel a lot of their minerals through legitimate sources. So given the number of minerals that this company must export to create these golf clubs, it's just impossible to say that all of these exports are conflict free, no matter how you, no matter what way you put it, because they're using these conflict minerals, it, chances are they're conflict minerals, even if the supply chains have been vetted. Golf as a sport has an estimated fan base of 450 million people across the world. Golf as a sport is most popular in North America, Western Europe, and East Asia. So this, this provides kind of an interesting context for our investigation. This shows that golf as a sport uh, and as a destructive supply chain is disproportionate in how it impacts our world. So as we can see here in the bottom right is we have a, uh, um, a pretty familiar image from this class. It divides the world into a global north and global south. So golf as a sport is most often recreated and popular as a pastime in the global north, where all of a lot of the materials it takes in the manufacturing that takes place to make these golf clubs available to the market all take place in the global south, including the, the um, labor demands and the environmental demands as well. So golf as a sport disproportionately impacts our globe, uh, divided along the global north and the global south. Pretty interesting. Thank you so much for listening to this lecture. I hope that it was very interesting and I hope that you have a great day out there on the course. I think I might go play another nine.